Hello and welcome. This is the Bits vs. Fight podcast. I'm your host, Ama Grigic, and today I have Bob van Luyt. He's uh, the founder at uh, Semi, and uh, we're going to hear all about uh, what they do. So welcome, Bob. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, no problem. Uh, so could you tell me a little bit about your background and uh, how you got started? Yeah, sure. So uh, I work in, the, in, the, in software, and uh, the story that I always tell about uh, my background is that I, uh, um, I grew up with the internet. So, uh, yes, that makes me a millennial. <laughs> and um, um, when I was 15 years old, I had, like, a job. And I had, like, there were, like, what I had to do, there were, like, toothbrushes who were, like, returned to a warehouse. And I had to, like, unpack, the, unpack these, these toothbrushes. And then, for example, I had, like, one, and I said, like, for example, Amr. And I had to, like, find the A and then find, you know, fill in the yeah, yeah, yeah. John and then find G. And this guy sold these toothbrushes and he also had like, you know, lighters and that kind of stuff. And he sold them at, um, uh, at, at gas stations, right? So I hear him say like, uh, he goes like, you know what? We can actually, uh, we can sell these things like on the internet. But how the hell do we get to a website? And I go like, well, I can build you a website. <laughs> and I was like 15 or something. And I mean, I mean, those websites, they, man, they were ugly. Yeah. They were shitty websites. But I, I can build you a website. So he said, sure. And <laughs> then he said like, so how much money do you want to have for that? So I go like, yeah, now, well, 500 euros. And the guy goes like, okay, that's fine. And I'm like, holy cow, wow. <laughs> I've never made so much money. So, uh, uh, and then it started. And then I went to art school. Because then I thought, let's study art, and um, um, and um, totally different direction. Well, it depends. It is it is creative, of course. I mean, there is some creative creative things in there, but uh. yeah. So that's the argument that I would make. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. So yeah. and and the um, uh, but I was still writing software then to just make some money, and I and after that I really got interested in the business from that comes from that, and that was just when I grew older. Yeah. And then I came to a point that I needed to make a decision. And then I decided to go into, into business. So, yeah. so I started with consultancy first and, and then more into products. Mm -hmm. And uh, always did that for myself. So I always, uh, always had my own businesses. And, um, um, uh, so, and that's where I am right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's interesting that you, you mentioned that because uh, I see a lot of people that do that. So they start off with kind of doing consulting, uh, doing some freelance work, of course, and, uh, and then going into the product. So what was your reasoning behind doing that? So there, there were two reasons. So, so the first reason is that the, um, uh, that you, with consultancy, you come in some kind of a recurring thing right so you come you go somewhere in and then you you help to solve something but you see similar problems and um um uh so you see people who build like more surface products around that right so for example uh there can be like a design agencies sure, or yeah. more um, uh, recruitment agencies or whatever um but it can also be like more products like for example there can be like cms systems or whatever and I became really, really intrigued with, um, with organizing data. Mm -hmm. That's what I find interesting. Yeah. And because in the, that's all in the core. And, and I go very far in that. So I, I, uh, a few months ago, I wrote something on my, on my blog. I, I wrote about um, how I think that whole software development is now taking its place back in the physical world. And I mean, we can go into that if you want to, but, yeah, but sure. the point is the, I, I take that very far. Mm -hmm. So so what we get from that. So um, um, to go, go back to your question, so I wanted to have a product that I could take with me, that I that I could go to people and it's like, hey, actually, I can help you. Um, uh, but uh, if you use this product, so yeah. then if you use this product, we can build something for you on top of that. Yeah. So that was this. That was the the goal. That was the first idea. Yeah, and it scales better. That's that's the 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 thing, right? I mean, yeah. it, you cannot multiply yourself. <laughs> that's a little bit a little bit difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 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 here we need to plant flags, right? In yeah. the In the discussion we have. So yeah, you can like have a discussion about like the technology. Yeah, sure. So why make you? Do, and you can uh, you can say like another flag would be the business. Right? Yeah. And, and when you, so I was just referring more to the technology, but if we would now step to the business side, of course. Eh? So product skills, mm. if, it's, if it's a successful product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't work, then, then it's a little bit different. But. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but let's, let's, for the sake of argument uh, in, the, in the discussion, uh, assume it does. Yeah. 
So and then it of course it scales and and um, um, and there's a lot of stuff happening and I'm very intrigued also with that and what's happening there and then if you want to we can also go into those kind of business models mm. in software business models. Yeah, we'll do that for sure because yeah. uh, what you're doing with Semi is uh, is interesting. But maybe you can explain a little bit more about what you want to provide as a company. Yeah. yeah. So Semi is short for uh, Semantic Machine Insights and. So back to the big question, like, so how do we organize data, right? Mm-hmm. So how do we do that? So you know, or maybe that's also the past, I don't really know, but I think it's still an ongoing thing. We talk about these data lakes. So we just take a lot of data and we just, you know, throw it up on a pile and, um, and then we'll figure stuff out, right? So well, now, I mean, I think you notice from the way I describe it that I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's another route that you can take. So I had this, this one is the unstructured data sets, looking at unstructured data. The other way is doing that the absolutely other way around. So it's like we're going for, as I like to call it, to be something that's hyper-structured. So then the question is, so structured around what, right? So what do we structure around? And there I'm a big believer in language and language processing. So uh, what's in the name? So semantic machine inside. So, so what we have is like we have a product and a product is called Reviate and Reviate is a, is a knowledge graph. And that sounds very fancy, but it's, it's literally that. So it's first of all, it's a graph in where you make relations between things and those things are described in language. Mm-hmm. So for example, I can have a company with the name Apple, but I can also have a fruit with the name Apple. Yeah. And what a knowledge graph does is that it understands that if I have a fruit, which is an apple, that it is less closely related to the company Apple to, for example, the company Amazon. Mm. It, it understands those relations. Yeah, so it has to have some context, right? It needs to have context, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And there we have something which we call uh, a contextionary. And uh, so context unary. So it's yeah. like a dictionary, but then the, the thing that gives context. And what it does is that... It's something, and I, if people are interested in that, they can look on our website or they can, they can Google it. It's uh, uh, talking about Google, by the way. Google is a famous knowledge graph, eh? yeah. a Google search. But the, um, um, uh, it, it's called word vect- uh, vectorization. And what you do is um, um, words are placed in a space with a relation to them. And I remember when I first saw that, so I was working for a client, and I first saw that in action, and that was magic for me. And there's like a famous um, uh, experiment that you do to see if your word vector works. And then you take certain words and then you look at the distances. So, for example, the famous example is like if you have um, the word king. Okay, so it's somewhere in vector space. Okay, now I'm going to do king minus the word man. And one, what you get. And then it says like the closest that it's queen. Mm. And that is... That was magic for me. Yeah, I was like, "Oh wow!" And um, and then I was looking. So how can we? How can we? How can I productize that? That was like not like in a week or something. It took <laughs> quite some time. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and then I started to look at so uh, so, and then things come up like you know a user, uh, sorry, developer user experience, and um, so it needs to be fast. It needs to it needs to scale big. It needs to be easy to use. Yeah, all those kind of things. So I made a lot of decisions there upfront that are now implemented. So people can now build these kind of knowledge graphs uh, based on a software reviewed like on a on a on a huge scale. Yeah, because um, as you said, you need a lot of data. Uh, the reason being, of course, is that you need to provide that context. Without a lot of data, you cannot even do that, right? That's the that's the whole idea behind it. Yeah. So, but that's also so that's that's part of our of our um uh, our, of our proposition. Yeah. So we'll, we'll give that to you. Yeah. So if you if you would have like a very small graph, so. Um, um, so, for example, I live in Wasp. So, if you would have a sm- very small graph where you say Bob lives in Wasp, it's no. a very tiny graph, <laughs> then we would give you all the tools to to already do whatever you want to do with that. Mm. So, um, uh, this is well, this is a very small example, but you don't have to have a lot of data to um, start working with it. Which is, by the way, a beautiful thing from from these kind of knowledge graphs, also. So yeah, yeah. Is it, uh, is that also because you, you when I look at your website, for example, you uh, describe it as a de- decentralized knowledge graph. Uh, is that also kind of the the idea behind doing it that way? So you can say, okay, we have this huge infrastructure because of all the people that are running it. Uh, is is that the reason why you did it also decentralized? Um, uh, the the reason so there were like 
two reasons why it's decentralized. Mm-hmm. So the first one is a technology reason. The second is a is a business reason. So so let me give them both to you. Yeah, sure. So the first one is the um, I, what I was intrigued with. Like so, we now having a conversation. So right. So for example, the knowledge graph has a vocabulary of about four hundred thousand words. And now we have a conversation. So you have a, voc- a vocabulary in your head and I have. So I was like, well, if I have like two of these software instances, they both know stuff and they could communicate, you know, to each other. They That's could what. share it, yeah. Yeah. So the simple example there could be you could have one knowledge graph that knows a lot about cities and another knowledge graph knows a lot about products. And now you can say the product, this product is in that city and you can combine them over different knowledge graphs. Now, so that's, that's from a technology perspective. So you create a peer-to-peer network if you want to, um, yeah. or a closed one or an open one, whatever you want to, to make those relations. And there are also like from a uh, software architecture perspective reasons why you might want to do that, but that's, that's one. The business reason behind that is as follows. So I was thinking about, okay, so if I'm going in this space, I'm going to compete with giants. Right. Yep. So that's like, I mean, that's kind of... I Amazon, that, Google, those kind of... Uh, yes, or, or IBM, right? Yeah. So it's like, so what do they all have that I can do different? And then I came to the conclusion they all centralized. So let's say that you are uh, a bank mm-hmm. or, a, um, uh, or like an um, uh, engineering uh, company that has like a lot of data on on a machines or whatever, which is sacred to you, right? That's your sacred data. Or or if you have like a, a retailer with a lot of customers, you don't want to give that away, right? Mm. So what what IBM, Google, and and uh, Amazon so what they say is like, well, we can do magic for you if you give us your data. Yeah. And now I'm not talking about sending it to the public cloud. I'm really say, saying like. So you really need to send that through the machine learning models of those companies, and you're not sure what happens there, which is kind of dangerous, uh, and especially from a business model, uh, a business perspective, if you, if you look what happened with companies like, you know, Toys R Us and those kind of things, so it's dangerous. So it's like, hey, that might be my business angle. Mm. So I can help companies, A, or do it alone, or collaborate, without that they need to send their data to me. I mean, if they want to, they can. I can host it for them if they want to. But if they don't want to, mm. they can host it wherever they want. And then I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. And that's what we now see with a lot of like our, our clients and, and hopefully future uh, customers that they go like, oh, that's interesting. So we don't have to send it that away. No, you don't have to send it away. Mm. So now things like um, uh, if they want to create be- better services for the customers, they don't have to worry about like GDPR stuff, so they can only focus on what they want to do and let's create better business for their customers. Yeah. So, so that was the angle we took from a, from a business perspective. And that's why I think that peer-to-peer is interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for the, for the listeners, just to give a little bit of context, of course, the peer-to-peer network was uh, most famous, uh, I, I think, by, uh, made by Napster and uh, Kazaa and all those kind of <laughs> programs from the past uh, where uh, people would share, uh, for example, their music libraries with, with each other and you would connect through everyone <laughs> that's pretty much the basic the basic explanation of course uh but what was interesting to me uh, in that story is that you don't have to send those that data away so how how does that work for a client so say they want to uh, use your product how would they go about doing that yeah so um uh, so, so if they so they can use the product in multiple ways yeah. right so so the core of our software is open source so so if you want to you can just you can just use it Mm. And you can you can do whatever you want and build networks and what have you. And then we also have an enterprise version of the product. Uh, and we have something which we call a, a, a turnkey platform uh, or a white label platform, actually. And the enterprise version comes with a lot of additional tools which you need as an enterprise. Uh, 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 and the white label platform helps you to even monetize on your data if you want to. So the distinction that we made is that we said, like, okay, so the core of the software is going to be open, and so that's how you can use it. And everything that an enterprise or an SME may need uh, for, what, for a variety of reasons, that's something that we, that's what we sell, right? That is, that is our value proposition. Um, 
um, so getting started with it is actually it's it's really easy. I mean, you can you can you know you can run it on your laptop if you want to. I mean, then it doesn't scale very far. <laughs> but y- yeah, you see my point. So, yeah, yeah. So we made it as easy as possible to use it. Yeah. And so how does that how does that work? So say for instance, I have some data that I want to. Uh, does it uh, do you like send it and it analyzes it, or how does it how does it actually work in that in that yeah, sense? Sure. Yeah. So how how does that data ingestion also happen? So uh, can you explain a bit about that? Yeah. So the first thing that you need to do is like you, you need to that's like a one time endeavor. Mm-hmm. You need to explain what your knowledge graph is about. So if you have a um, a bicycle shop, mm-hmm. I'm making this up. So then you can say, well, I have my bicycle bicycle shop. So I have customers. I have parts of the bike. I have products that I sell. I might have multiple stores that I sell. So you, that's what you give. That's what we formally we call that an ontology. Yep. In which you describe so like I have a, I have a, a business and I have like parts, and what you do is that with language you describe what kind of stuff it is. And so to give you for example an example, if you use the word company, mm-hmm. in English you have like in English you have like a company as in a business, but you also have a company in the army. Yeah. Which is how oh, I have a company which relates to business and physical location, etc. So the better you do that, the better the um, uh, um, the business air quotes eh? the, the, the knowledge graph understands what you mean when you've done that you can start adding that data and just doesn't matter yeah well no it doesn't matter how much that is I mean um, I, I dare people uh, to, to try it out <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you can add a lot yeah. and um, that's it and you start using it and it's really API focused and uh, for the for the technology people listening to this podcast it's uh, um, it, it's it's mostly uh, GraphQL based. Okay, so yeah. we we focus really on on leveraging um, uh, graph queries. That makes sense in your case, uh, using GraphQL. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So so and um, uh, and then we have a whole structure in, in GraphQL. I, I even have somebody who's really her role is to really think about uh, the, the 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 user experience of the GraphQL queries. Yeah, uh, because that's basically where we end. And then yes, I have. Also, somebody working on two people working on like a graphical user interface, etc. But that's really from the the core product. That's where it stops at the API level. And then we try to make it as easy as possible for you to add it to whatever product that you have. So if it's if it's an IoT application, if it's a, a website application, if it's a, a, a CRM application, it really doesn't matter. So if you can express it in language, boom, you can yeah. do it. Yeah, it's interesting for us as well as if you, if I look what Tevreden does, I mean, we have a lot of textual data, right? So we have all the open answers that people give on the surveys. And that's that's uh, but also something we were, we were thinking about as well. It's like, okay, we need to... That, that actually gives more context than someone that gives a, a grade of a, a seven or an eight, right? We, especially the clients always say, okay, why do we get this? So why do we get the seven or what, what do we need to change to get to an eight or to a nine, right? And that's, the, that's their focus. Uh, so that's, that's something that, I've, uh, that we've think, well, you think about, of course, uh, doing kind of textual analysis and also providing some, uh, maybe some context, but also uh, sentiment analysis and stuff like that. So what, what I was wondering about is that, okay, I give, uh, for example, I, uh, I, Provide that that data that I want to to provide. So how do you output that back to me? So how how did how does someone get back something from your uh, product in that sense, or do they get anything back for, uh, immediately? How how does that work? Yes. So so um, so, so two things. So first first of all, so what you just mentioned. So uh, what you were you working with with the uh, Vrede.nl. So that is exactly that's that's our our that's the value space that we're in. So. Because if you build that kind of software, it's difficult. Yep. That's like, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, we can't do it just because of the sheer scale that you would need to bring it to. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, uh, and just now imagine that also um, uh, we do this for SMEs, but also for, for corporates. Um, uh, this just comes out of the box. So um, you said, like, how do you give that, that, um, um, uh, those answers? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the answer that you're looking for, but th- we, we do that through the API. So we, the API sure, provides yeah. you with those answers. And there's, like, a, a difference in between the, the, the graph part, the network part, and the, and the, and the, the knowledge part, if you will. 
um, um, which we were to make a distinction in. And so we first focused on the infrastructure and of the local infrastructure, then the network infrastructure. And we're now uh, moving into the, the, um, uh, the, the, the knowledge structure, if you will. Yeah. But the thing is that the, the, the overlaying idea is that in theory, every question that you have based on data. So for example, if you t- look at tevreden.nl, so you would say, and you would ask a question like, so what do people on average like the most about a product? So the argument is that in theory, you need to be able to answer any question with a natural language. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, you need to be able to provide an answer based on any natural language question. Um, uh, and that's our overarching goal. That's, where, that's our goal. So mm-hmm. our goal is, are we there yet? No. No. But that's where we're moving towards. So just imagine that you now can build whatever application you want. Doesn't matter if it's like a, 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 a new version of tevreden.nl or if it's a web shop or if it's an IoT thing or a big data, whatever. You can always do that with the same data tool. Always. Mm. Doesn't matter what you do. If you do make it big, if you make it small, if you want to be fast, if you want it to be big. Um, that's our goal. And that sounds very big, but we're slowly getting there. Um, yeah, it's a big, it's a big order. <laughs> it's a tall order, as they would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like, I mean, you know, uh, aim high, right? So yeah, we, of course. And that's that's what we we're going towards. And I, why do we end at the API level? So somebody who might listen to this podcast and who is maybe not like a technology person might might ask him or herself the question like, so why? Why at the API level, right? Why don't you go even further, right? Yeah, why don't you build a UI or yes. whatever? Yeah. yeah, So and that's a good question. So that's a great question. And the answer is very simple. So I have to, I want to go, I want to find a form of quant- quantity in how I can serve my, my client. So if I have an IoT-based solution, so, uh, so over the weekend I had a discussion about somebody who wants to use WeVA to build an IoT-based solution. That's a completely different um, uh, 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 solution that, for example, you might need at Tevreden.nl. Yeah, yeah. So the question was like, so what is the lowest level that I can go, but give the most functionality to our customers? And I decided that's the API level. Yeah. So Because yes, the UI would be different in every case. That's, that's exactly. really Here much you go. it. Yeah. Here you go. So how we solve that is like, so in, in Semi, we also have like a consultancy branch. So some of our customers say like, great that we have the software, but please send in one or two people that can help to us help to set us. it up. Yep. Sure. So we do that. So they're very knowledgeable about like how the software works and what they can do. Um, uh, so that, that's how we help. Cool. Yeah, that's, it's, as, as you said, it's a big, uh, it's a big mission <laughs> that, yeah. that, you want to, what, that you want to accomplish, of course. But mm-hmm. uh, I think, uh, I think there is, there's a lot of uh, space to do that because, uh, I, as you said, the bigger players are doing it just in one way and you're kind of providing something that's, well, it's, a, it's an alternative, right? If you want to build it yourself, you could. That's, yeah, that's the idea. So uh, what was interesting also that you mentioned is that you have an open source uh, offering. Yeah. Um, what, was, what was the reason behind doing it in open source? Because that's uh, always tricky. People say, okay, you cannot make money off open source and stuff like that. But uh, you, maybe you can explain a bit why you uh, picked that uh, as an option. Yeah, okay, sure. So again, so we have our two things, our two flags, right? So we have our technology flag and our business flag. So first, let's take the technology route. So in, if you look at technology, I believe you can build better software if you do it open source. Why? Firstly, it's ma- it makes it much easier to use other packages, right? It just, it, there's a lot of, especially when you look at machine learning and those kind of things, there's a lot of open source uh, stuff available, which makes it very easy to integrate if it's open. Um, secondly, um, um, if it's open, I believe the quality goes up. And um, uh, let's take the conversation that we have right now. Right now, well, maybe let, let me give another example. So, for example, if you, would take, if you would create PowerPoint slides, right? If you would create a PowerPoint presentation maybe for, like, your colleagues, then it might have a certain so-so quality. But if you make a PowerPoint presentation and you need to go on stage somewhere on a conference and present it for 1,500 <laughs> people, probably the output of your PowerPoint is going to be better. And if they record it and, you know, live stream it on YouTube, it might even be better. So the, uh, because it has like, it's open, so um, um, uh, uh, I think the quality goes up on mm. the software. 
uh, thirdly, um, there's, a, there's a marketing thing to that. So people say like, so Bob, that's quite a claim that you have, what you want to do. Um, um, we don't want to buy a magic box that does it. Okay, so it's open. Go there, look at it. You, you can see it. You can try it out, whatever you want. Um, thirdly, it's like, uh, fourthly, no, where am I? Three or four? I don't know. I, I think it was somewhere about <laughs> three or four. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's fun for people to work on. Mm. Um, um, so the um, uh, I know this from the software people. I mean, you should ask them, right? But yeah. the, I, I, what they give the feedback they give me is that they like work on open source software. It's yeah. cool, right? It's like you can show it to your friends, you can show it to your peers. Um, uh, so that that's one. So that's the, that's the group why I believe in in open. Source. It just makes it much easier to integrate in cloud infrastructure. Well, I can keep going on from a technology perspective. Then you have the, um, um, the business perspective to it, right? So, and if you talk about the business, the question is like, so what's our value proposition, right? So what do, what's the value that we bring? And um, the value that is maybe not necessarily captured only in the software part. It would be for our SME and enterprise users too easy to say, it's just the software, here you have a software package. Good luck with it, right? Bye. Um, that's not it. So the value lies in the fact that, for example, the licensing that's, that's related to it, right? Uh, basically, an open source license says, like, you know, use it if, however you please, but if it's, you know, there's no warranty at all. So if you use this in production and it breaks, then sorry, it's... Uh, we can't it, help you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that changes with an enterprise version. So we change the license, right? We change SLAs. We give access to consultants. We give access to uh, scaling uh, software. We give access to cloud infrastructure where you can use it on, well, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when it comes to our um, uh, white label platform, we give access to monetization tools. So if you want to use our software to uh, uh, sell your data, we can do that too. Um, uh, so that is really focused on what the, the, the value proposition lies in, like what are you solving? Right? How do you create your use cases? How do you create your business use cases? And how can we help you with that? Um, the other upside of that is that, the, um, uh, is that I am a strong believer in um, being open by default. And what I mean with that is that we see that a lot of traditional organizations are closed. Mm -hmm. And so they say, like, we're closed unless, you know, whatever. So we approve, you can say this. I want to do this the other way around. Like, we, we try to be as transparent as possible. So maybe certain strategic directions we're taking, et cetera, that, that's something we're not, we don't share, but we share, everything's open, which makes it very easy for the people who, who work in, um, uh, in my business to just go out and talk about it. So a software developer never has to ask me, can I talk about this? It's open. Yeah. So sure, <laughs> yes, please, right? Yeah. Um, um, so, so that, so that's in a nutshell the two reasons why I believe in those uh, those open uh, uh, open models. Yeah, and what, what do you feel uh, when we look at some of the challenges with an open source product? What, what do you feel those are? Well, um, I think that I can best um, explain um, the challenges based on uh, on an example. So, there are two famous open source. Uh, um, uh, Business example, I mean, there are more, but two famous to, to contradict each other. And one is Elastic, right? Elastic built a beautiful um, uh, a business around like the open source proposition that they have and the business they build on top of that. Another one is Redis, Redis Labs. But what is interesting is that this, the open source software Redis has is already gives enough value uh, to the end users, that there's not really a need to go for an enterprise version. Mm. So if you look at, um, and I, I'm not 100% sure about what I'm about this, but it, it's some something along the lines of what I'm about to say. The, if you look at Redis in AWS or Redis in Google Cloud, etc., or it's the open source version is just good enough. It's yeah. just for what you want to do. It's good enough. So the problem they need to solve is like, so, okay, what are we selling? Yeah. Um, that's a danger. So the danger is that you might open too much. Um, um, that and a danger might be that the other way, the other way around is that you're go going to look at open source as some kind of a freemium model. Like, yeah, we just, 
you know you can you can add only uh, uh, three nodes or something. three nodes like, exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i find that very dangerous so that's i, I never would take that route uh, and then I wouldn't really call it open source. Then I would just call it a freemium model. So, so the, the Redis example is what I would describe as the danger. That's yeah. like, and that's, yeah, that's very difficult to foresee. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that was also, it, it leads good into my next question, actually, <laughs> uh, which was also uh, what I've seen from a lot of open source projects is that it's hard to monetize, right? So it's hard to kind of get to, uh, get people to go from an open source project or an open source, uh, however you want to call it, a, a product, to actually get to license them or get to get them to actually get a license, an enterprise license or whatever. So, um, what do you do? You, do you see a lot of problems with that? So, people moving from open source to enterprise is that something that's hard to do, or how do you see that? Well, so I so I think this has to do with the. Um um, with the with the with the value proposition, right? Mm. And so um, there's a threshold in the form of willingness to pay. So what are people paying for, right? So um, I've seen people work on open source projects that became uh, successful, and when they tried to monetize on, on them, they, they 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 didn't succeed in that. That is often the case because, I believe, because it's modular. So it's like it's this specific niche thing that's being solved. It's like a software package or whatever. It's, it's not really a product. It's more like a modular thing. Mm. Um, so in our situation, our value proposition is not only around software. It's also how we help business to create their use cases, to enhance their business. Uh, it, it's it's way more. It's like it's then the software. I mean, we can't do it without software, but the software is just part of it. And what you often see with what you just described is like it's only like okay, I built this thing. Um, uh, it's it's very useful for people. Um, uh, can I monetize on that? But then it's only focused on the software, and it's just too much to. Um, uh, it's not really a product. It's more like a, a module that you can use. Mm-hmm. Um, and the value capture is something else. So, I, I mean, the first thing is like, what's the value proposition, right? So, what's the end? So, let me give you an example. So, what I did is I targeted uh, the stuff we do at Semi First at data scientists and IT people. And by coincidence, we got in touch with business people. And then we learned, hey, actually, that's our target audience because they, in the end, make the decisions and what they need. So, we, we shifted a little bit of strategy there to focus on business people. Mm. Of course, we work with data scientists. Of course, we work with IT people. But often, they can already use our open source version of software. You're like, okay, great. Open source version, we'll use that for mm. us to do something specific. But if we look at, and great, they, they should do that. Wonderful, because they give us feedback. They, they, they tell us what's good. They tell us what's shitty, etc. But the, um, uh, the business people have much more wishes, many more wishes than only the, um, uh, just a piece of software. So that's how we did that from a strategic business point of view. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes much bigger than just only having an open source software project. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. The, the only thing I'm, I'm wondering about is that, um, is it hard for them to understand what you want to do or what you want to provide as a, as a, as a service? Is that, is that hard for the kind of business people? Because it is, of course, a very technical product when you look at it that way. Well, that depends, right? So if you go to a business person and you say like, okay, what do you want? And then they say like, well, I want, um, um, I want a website. I want to type in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, then, and then the question is, so do you think you need a database? And then they all go like, yeah, yeah. And we need one, right? <laughs> <laughs> so my point is the it, it's, I mean, not that we've hit this database, but the point that I'm trying to make is that you, it's not too difficult to make that case, but it take it's about the angle you take to tell about what you do. So to technology people, that's also in the beginning of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Why is it like there? I want to plant two flags. So you tell a different story to the technology people than you do to the business people. And what we know from the research that we've done in uh, with Sema when we started the business is that. Um, in Forbes 500, there's like companies, there's like 95% of CTOs say like, listen, we can't solve the business problem. 95%. That's a, that's a huge market opportunity. But it's like, we know we have the data, but we can't do it. It just, it, we can't do it. 
So that's our that's our that's our opportunity. That's the the gap that we that we jumped into. That mm. We said, okay, tr- give it a try with our software, and now try to build something on top of it. And that is the um, um, that's how, and that's a different story that you tell to business people based on the software than you tell to technology people. Yeah, and I, I think that's 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 a good point because um, I I get that because from a techno if if you're looking at it from a tech view. Uh, you're going to explain what the what the features are and what you can do with the product and stuff like that. But uh, that's what a lot of I think a lot of startups also forget is to kind of add the what the what does it mean for my business, right? Yes. So what what can it provide for my business uh, as a value? And that's that's something that a lot of uh, a lot of startups, in my opinion, uh, forget. They forget that that it has to add value, not just cool features, right? Yeah. So the, the other day I gave a, I gave a talk to, to business people and I got a similar question. I said like, so can I ask something to the room? Right. So I asked the room. So how many of business people here uh, can't achieve what they want with their current infrastructure or current data? Literally almost a hundred percent. I mean, I it was not a hundred percent, but almost a hundred percent of hands went up. I said, you're all my potential customers. And then I went like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And <laughs> then they listened very carefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, um, so, so that. And we, we can solve everything, but, but we see that a lot of use cases now move towards um, more, more fuzzy solutions, right? So, for example, what you said from Tevreden.nl, mm-hmm. capturing all the, um, uh, the data that you're getting from the research you're doing that's probably solved, right? Yep. So you just have regular database. That's all in there. Works, yeah. And now the next step that you're probably getting as like a business requirement is like, yeah, well, we have all these fields with like text in it and, and uh, or it's just organized in just tables. We want to organize it differently because we have different questions that we now want to do. We want to improve our business in different ways. And that's where we come, you know, that's where we jump in. So... Um, um, uh, it's just a new way of looking at data. It's a new way uh, uh, at looking at organizing data. Um, um, so that's 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 the, the value space that we're in. Very cool. And well, I want to ask you a little bit of a harder question in that sense. Is sure. that uh, what, what do you see kind of for the future? Because that's that's always a hard a hard thing to <laughs> to to, to yeah. explain. But what what do you see kind of the, for the future of what you're doing right now? Uh, so, so you mean with my business yeah. or in general? Yeah, in, in general for, for the kind of space that you're in, right? So what you want, want to solve. So as you said, there are a lot of big players in there already. Uh, what, what do you see you contributing to that, for example, in, the, uh, in a few years, for example? Yeah, so, um, so there's, this, there's this economic um, um, uh, theory, and I forgot the name, so, so we, we have to look that up, but the, and it says... The following: It says, like, if you a company that um, uh, that creates value in a certain way, often misses the next wave. And a very simple example of that is, for example, if you look at um, uh, uh, the desktop computer. So Windows, eh? so Microsoft or Windows was like, I mean, they dominated that space. And then the next wave was the mobile phone. And what they basically did is that the mobile phone, that was like Windows on a mobile phone. That's like, it literally had a start thing, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So that didn't really work out for them. Uh, but Apple was in that space. And then the next wave after that was like with wearables. So you see that, uh, that, the, that the, the Apple Watch is actually an iPhone crammed into an Apple Watch. And uh, so there now, there's now an opportunity for other players to, to, to reinvent that. Um, now to the big picture, to the B2B picture, as I mentioned earlier, the, those big players focus on centralization, their business models, how they capture value, uh, how their technology is created is focused on being centralized, which comes with a problem, as you mentioned. So the problem is like, how do you get people and business so far that they send their valuable data, uh, and more importantly, the insights hidden in that data to them. That's why I make a distinction between Storing something on one of the big cloud providers, that's one. But having them analyze it, that's the second thing. So we hope that that's the next wave, right? The next wave will be like, let's decentralize a little bit more. Uh, And let's work together with those cloud providers, but make it secure for people to Hmm. do something on-prem if they want to, in a secure uh, virtual private cloud environment if they want to, et cetera. 
So that's that's what we believe in. That's one. And the second thing is, I yeah, I'm a big believer in semantics. So I think that looking semantically at data. So what's what what does the language say that that expresses the data that um, 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 to focus on that? There's like a famous saying in the in the semantic world, and it's like that they say like not strings but things. So what they and what they basically mean is like the database is just a blob of bits and bytes, but the um, um, uh, uh, these these knowledge graphs more focus on like so what is the thing? What does it express? What what does it mean in the world? Um, uh, so that's that that's what I would argue that I that I believe for the uh, uh, for the future. Very cool, very cool. So to wrap up, my last question. Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's always the last question. So what are you most proud of? What are you most proud of since you started this whole journey that you are on? What I'm the most proud of? Um, well, I, I, I would say the whole journey. So the, this literally started from like a personal frustration I had with Anna <laughs> and that I just literally just opened the GitHub uh, repository, which was once just empty. And I just started working in that. And then I was like, hey, maybe there's an opportunity. And hey, maybe we can build business around it. And, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the whole journey that I'm proud of and all the spin-off that comes of it. I th- I'm also very proud of the, the people. And so the, the, all, all the, 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 um, the people that believe in this and they go like, you know, Bob, we're going to help you make this a success. So let, let's go for that one. I go for <laughs> the people. I'm I, most I think, proud of the people that, that, that I gathered around this. That's a nice one. I think that's, that's a great way to, to end off. Um, so how can people find you on the, uh, on the internet? Yeah, so they can, they can find my, my business, they can find on the, uh, um, uh, on the website uh, semi.network, so smi.network. Uh, they find their links to the GitHub, so whatever. whatever. Um, if you just Google me, uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. And um, so uh, my name is uh, Bob van Luyt, but I guess that will also be Yeah, it will uh, be the in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of so, course. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, and for the listeners, you can uh, find the Bits vs. Byte podcast on uh, bitsvsbytes.com. Also on uh, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram. It's all Bits vs. Bytes. And uh, find us on all major platforms for uh, podcasting. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all over the place. Uh, thank you for listening and until next time. <laughs>